ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Francois Lacoste de Nou. Well, good morning and welcome to uh, Agility in Boston. I'm happy to be here. This is my second uh, Agility with F5. Last year we were in Chicago and I talked about the importance for all of us of embracing change. And at the time I committed to you that F5 would be a partner that would take bold risks, that would move faster, and that would make the investments necessary to get ahead of the changes that you needed from us. Today I have a lot more clarity on what that change looks like. So I wanna do two things today. First, I wanna convince you, if you're not already, that we have entered a new age of capital. We have entered an age where the most valuable assets that any enterprise can possess are their applications. And the second thing I wanna do is I want to be giving you a very clear sense of how F5 is transforming into what we've called a multi-cloud application services company, which is essentially a company that is 100% focused on enabling you to deploy, manage, protect this new form of capital. Now I'm conscious we're having this conversation here in New England, a place rich with history for this country. And so I've taken the liberty to talk about capital going back a little bit into history. So I'm gonna take you back thousands of years. For 5,000 years, the world economy evolved at the pace of population growth and the availability of raw materials. And that pace of evolution was in fact pretty slow. All of that changed about 200 years ago with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. Of course, the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution was in Great Britain where a growing population, a more stable society, had need for more manufactured goods, and those needs were met with increasing availability of raw materials, from England, of course, but also from their colonies all over the world. And that intersection spurred innovation, the steam engine, the cotton gin, which in turn created an entire new ecosystem of businesses. We saw tool makers emerge, steam engine innovators, factories that operated equipment, railways, whole new ecosystem of businesses. The birthplace of the revolution was in England, but I said there was history here because it was in fact not far from here on the banks of the Charles River that a fellow called Francis Lowell pioneered the first truly integrated production of cotton in fact, his company, the Boston Manufacturing Company, pioneered what's now called company towns. He had a mill owner build schools, churches, nurseries, lecture halls for their employees. And all over New England, on the banks of the rivers here, we saw these mill towns emerge, which was an entirely different way of living and working. And there were a ton of changes brought about by the Industrial Revolution. But the one defining change in of that era was a redefinition of value. Businesses were no longer valued on the basis of the raw materials they had access to. They were valued on the basis of the machinery, the equipment that they owned. It was the industrial age or the age of the machines. Of course, Throughout the 1800s, financiers invested more and more into more sophisticated equipment. Machinery proliferated across factories and businesses needed more sophisticated labor to operate, to maintain, to design, to upgrade these machines. And by the turn of the century into the 1900s, the intelligence, the education, the experience of people in organizations became the core differentiating value for companies. And essentially we entered the age of human capital. 
And again, a new ecosystem of businesses emerged. We saw services-based businesses emerged that provided human capital on demand, consultancies, financial services companies. We saw an explosion of universities around the world that developed human capital. We saw large companies emerge that hoarded large amounts of human capital to develop intellectual property. Companies like GE, IBM, Coca-Cola. I would say to a large extent, we were in the age of human capital at the turn of this century. In fact, when I entered the, the technology industry uh, in the late 90s, I still remember today that we used to forecast the prospects of technology companies on the basis of how many masters they had, or how many PhDs, or how many engineers they had in a particular domain. I think that all changed in 2014. I believe we've now entered the age of application, application capital. And by that I mean applications, software applications, are truly the most valuable assets that any enterprise can possess today. I say it all changed in 2014 because that, of course, is the year that Facebook bought WhatsApp. I'm sure many of you remember they paid $19 billion for a company that had 55 engineers. And like me, perhaps many of you were trying to do the math on the basis of a human capital paradigm, and we couldn't quite figure out how they would ever get a return on paying $350 million per engineer. And of course, they weren't doing the math on the same paradigm. They didn't buy 55 engineers, they bought a messaging application that had 400 million users at the time, more than a billion today. But it was a fundamentally different way of engaging users than the traditional Facebook application. And so applications really are the raw material. They're the embodiment of the raw material, the human capital, and the machinery of the digital age. And I say that because I can see it in the DNA, in the capital structure of some of the most valuable companies on the planet today. I just mentioned Facebook. This is a company that has 30,000 employees. They spend less than $50 billion in CapEx, yet they have an application portfolio that's valued at half a trillion dollars. Netflix, under 6,000 employees, spends virtually no money on capital equipment, and yet they have an application portfolio valued at close to $160 billion, which is almost as high as IBM, kings of human capital, with 430,000 employees. The DNA of the most valuable companies is telling us that we have entered the age of application capital. And the number of applications around the world is booming. It's not something that's just happening with platform companies. At F5, we serve over 20,000 enterprise customers around the world across all verticals. And I'm seeing this phenomenon in every single one of the vertical we serve. During my first 15 months at F5, I've met dozens of our customers across these verticals. In the retail industry, I'm seeing our customers become more application-centric to respond to disruption from e-commerce retailers. In the financial services industry, I'm seeing our customers become more application-centric to respond to fintech disruption. In the healthcare space, our customers investing significantly in applications to remove friction between patients and service providers. I'm seeing it in manufacturing with automation. It's in fact not very different than what happened in the industrial age where over time, factories invested more and more in more sophisticated equipment, more sophisticated machinery. In the same way, companies today are becoming holders of applications and are becoming more, more efficient application capitalists. The result of all that is the number of enterprise workloads around the world is exploding. IDC forecast it's going to go from 250 million to 1.7 billion over the next three years. Who knows where it will go beyond that, but it tells you we're just in the early stages of this era of capital. 
The best way for me to illustrate this is actually to take an industrial age company. To share with you an example from a company that's more than 100 years old. Rolls-Royce, you all know as a uh, luxury car brand and um, aircraft engine manufacturer. Uh, that company has been around since 1904. Um, and yet, they're transforming their business model and becoming more application centric. They've written an application they call Indi Engine Condition Monitoring. And essentially, that application takes in flight data from their engines, sends it to one of their data centers. That data is crunched, uh, and data from this engine around thousands of parameters is compared to um, other uh, thousands of other flights and other engines analyzed. And by the time a plane lands, Rolls-Royce is able to give recommendations to their customers on things they can do to improve safety, to improve fuel efficiency, and improve performance of their operations. This is a 100-year-old company that's abandoning their leased commodity engine business and transforming into a subscription-based data analytics company. Now, if applications are booming, and we're seeing them proliferate, and every single vertical is investing more in applications capital, it begs the question, why are they so valuable? There are a thousand answers to that question, because applications do a ton of things for us. They forecast, they automate processes, they streamline supply chains. But I think applications do one thing that creates tremendous value for modern enterprises today. And that one thing is collapsing the cycle of value creation. I want to give you a process that every company in the planet has to do. This is the process of launching a product or a service or a solution into a target group of customers, trying to understand the response of these customers to this product, segmenting our customers by vert vertical or ge geography or by usage pattern, understanding their response to our product or our solution, and then as a result of that analysis, modifying our product, our service, our offer, and then going through the cycle again. For most human capital companies, this cycle takes months or weeks. We invest a lot of human energy into the cycle, and every company goes through that. The most valuable companies today have figured out a way to collapse the cycle in minutes or seconds. Essentially, they are mass customizing their solutions to an individual customer within minutes. This is exactly what happens when Spotify you know, comes up magically with a discovery playlist that aligns to your musical taste when they know a couple of songs you've listened to. It's the same thing that happens when airlines modify ticket prices on a given route to respond to supply and demand. It's what online retailers are able to do when they give you a um, a purchase recommendation based upon what you've put in your shopping cart. And it is what Rolls-Royce does when they give us this recommendation when a plane has just landed on how to improve flight operations. This collapsing of value creation is why applications are the center of value for modern enterprises today. So what are the challenges for application capitalists? Because there's so much value in these applications, if there's such a core part of how we create value for our customers, we better understand the challenges that exist for application capitalists and whether they're different than the challenges we faced in the era of machines or the era of human capital. At F5, we've been in the application deliver business for many years, and as a result, we study applications. We do research every year. We survey 3,000 of our customers every year to understand where they're going with their applications and what their challenges are. And I want to share with you the insights from the latest research because they tell us where we want to focus in solving the challenges of this application capital age. The first observation is that applications are being deployed everywhere. In our latest research, we found that Almost 70% of our customers deploy their applications 
in at least two public clouds in addition to their private data centers or co-location data centers. We dug into this a bit more to understand why there's such a proliferation of deployment environment. And what we found is more than half of our customers are actually making decisions on where to deploy an app on a, on a case by case basis, on a per application basis. They're essentially implementing a best cloud for the app strategy. In many ways, that's not a surprise again because I can draw an analogy to prior capital eras and look at 20th century multinational companies made decision to deploy their human capital offshore some resources or outsource some of their functions or put distribution centers closer to their customers. All of these were different ways to become more efficient human capitalist. And applications are now becoming such a part of our businesses that we are also becoming more efficient application capitalists. And as a result, the business case of where to put applications is going, is going through more and more scrutiny. I speak to customers all the time who are creating this balancing act of deciding and taking calculated risks as to whether they should put an application on premise or move it to a public cloud. It's a constant tension between speed and compliance, between cost and consistency. I'm sure you're going through that and everybody is experimenting with this mix right now. But the consequence of that balancing act, the consequence of that experimentation is complexity. Out of five, we call this the multi-cloud challenge. Some of the things that were already difficult when applications were in one physical location are becoming exponentially more difficult when they're distributed in multiple environments. And those challengers are applying consistent security policy across all environments, optimizing the performance of applications and having visibility into the health of applications. Those challenges are really at the core of the mission that we've set for ourselves at F5. We want to be your multi-cloud application services partner. That is, we want to be the company that allows you to deploy any application anywhere with a consistent set of enterprise-grade services. I don't believe that this is a challenge that can be solved by a single cloud provider. I believe that this is a challenge that has to be solved by players that are cloud agnostic, that don't care where you decide to deploy your applications. A player that understands application, a player that understands security, and a player that is committed to your journey with your applications. And that's really the transformation of F5. And I want to take you through that because that's essentially the third act in the evolution of the company. Many of you here have been with us uh, for many years in the journey, and you probably know this, that we, we came to market in the late 90s um, with pioneering a technology called load balancing. And really, at the time, we were serving the, the dot com and we were helping them scale their website. In the early 2000s, we made a pivot to the enterprise market. It was a pretty significant pivot in terms of the customers we targeted, but also we innovated with a technology that we've now come to call ADCs, Application Delivery Controllers. And essentially, at the time, we, we added significant traffic management capabilities and security capabilities um, and developed strong application fluency. The stage we're in now, what I call multi-cloud application services, is really taking all of that application fluency, all of those learnings about how to make application perform, how to make them go faster and be safer, taking all of that learning and enabling you to deploy your applications, not in a physical data center only, but in wherever you want to take your applications, public cloud, private clouds, uh, and so on. That really is the focus of the company, and it's largely the result of conversations we've had with you over the years. Now, I want to take you through what we've done to make that mission a reality or to turn that vision a reality. And I want to take you through what we've done over the last couple of years because this journey really started two years ago and what we're going to do next. So if you look at what we've done already, we've essentially done two big things. Number one is we've made ourselves available in way more places than we were before. 
No, you want to put your applications in AWS today, we're there. In Azure, we're there. In Google Cloud, we're there. We're integrated with the major private cloud uh, platforms today. We're in the major co-location centers. And so we are where you want to find us. And the maturity of these integrations now is such that the experience most of our customers are having in consuming us in the major public clouds uh, is pretty seamless. The second thing we've done is we've made it much easier to consume F5 technology. We've created these new commercial models. We used to be only available on a perpetual basis. You can now consume F5 um, on a subscription basis, on a utility basis. We offer enterprise license agreements. And so some of these things align much better with the total cost of ownership you want uh, for your applications or the life cycle of your applications. Things get even more exciting going forward. We've got some very exciting plans over the next 18 months. And there's three big areas we're investing in. The first is automation and orchestration. We know that many of you want to interact with F5 technology through a more consistent and stable set of APIs, and we are doubling down on those investments. Our objective is really to significantly reduce the operational burden, the operational overhead of integrating F5 technology, deploying, uh, or upgrading F5 technology in your environment. And you're going to have some very exciting uh, developments from us in this area. In fact, Hitesh, who follows me uh, today, will talk about this. In 2019, we'll also be releasing two new application services platforms that are a great fit for modern enterprise application development. One is a package software solution, and the other one is an as-a-service solution for a native uh, uh, cloud consumption experience. Those solutions are horizontally scalable, they're lighter weight, uh, they support your CI, CD environment, um, and those will be coming to you uh, over the next 12 months uh, from F5. So very exciting new platforms that Kara actually will talk about in her, in her keynote tomorrow. And then lastly, we're going to be enhancing our application security portfolio, because security is such a big part uh, of our DNA and such a big part of solving the challenge of deploying applications across the multi-cloud. We're going to do more in anti-bot protection. We're going to do more in authentication. We're going to do more in SSL orchestration and service chaining. So you'll have a fuller portfolio of security services, again, available into all these consumption models from F5. So I've talked about the past. I've talked about what we're doing and where we're going as a company in the future. I now want to talk about the present. Um, and to do that, I want to bring with me on stage uh, a couple of customers who have been using uh, F5 to solve some of their challenges. Uh, and are going to share their experience with us here for a few minutes. So the first uh, customer that's going to join me um, is Jason Wing from the Motorist Insurance Group. Uh, the Motorist Insurance Group is a, an interesting company in the sense that they don't sell insurance directly to uh, businesses or end users, uh, but they have a, a set of insurance agents that use their portal to quote and sell insurance to, to their customers. And so that, that portal is an application uh, is absolutely critical uh, to the success of, of this company. And Jason's going to come and share with us uh, the large projects that they undertook to transform that, uh, that portal application. So please welcome to the stage Jason Wing from the Motorist Insurance Group. Welcome, Jason. Thanks, Francois. Thank you for joining us. So, um, Jason, perhaps you could start by sharing what, like, what is the uniqueness about the, the business model of the Motorist Insurance Group that led to specific requirements for uh, your portal and IT environment? Absolutely. Uh, so at the Motorist Insurance Group, uh, as Francois mentioned, we don't sell insurance directly uh, to someone that needs the insurance. It's sold through an independent insurance agent. And this is, an, this is an insurance agent that is able to sell any insurance. Um, our goal is for them to sell motorist insurance. And the way that that happens is they use our website, our, excuse me, our portal page to, um, to write policies and get quotes 
and uh, do claims and all of the things an insurance company does. So that, that portal has to work. It has to be fast, it has to be intuitive, and uh, the, the agent is not gonna spend a lot of time. If they can't find something, if it's, if it's clunky, um, they're, gonna, they're gonna go to the next insurance company's page mm. and, and use them, and that was happening. Mm. What was, why, why was it slow? Why, what was slowing down your portal? Yeah, so uh, Motorist Insurance Group is actually a, an umbrella um, of a number of different insurance companies where at, at one time, each of those insurance companies had their own infrastructure, their own mm -hmm. system, so their own policy mm -hmm. system, their own claim system, their own billing system. And as, as these companies came into the Motorist Insurance Group, we found ourselves in uh, taking on a significant amount of uh, technology debt, uh, mm -hmm. where now we have all these companies, they all have their own systems, so we have to support them. Mm -hmm. We have to keep you know, paying maintenance for them. Mm -hmm. And we have to make all of that information available on the portal page. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened was the agents would come in and maybe they would have to sign in multiple times to get to different different pieces of information. Um, sometimes it'd be hard to, uh, for the agent to, to say, well, I thought I was supposed to go this way, now you're supposed to go that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we realized that, we heard that from, from the agents. So uh, we needed to make a change. Now, I'm sure, I'm sure others can relate to this, having to stitch systems together. But in your case, it must have been an enormous task to stitch together these backend systems from various companies and come up with a more cohesive and, and faster solution. So how did you approach the, the project? Sure. Um, well, uh, we had, I'm going to back up one second. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the motorist had made a strategic decision to get away from all of those separate systems and go to one insurance system, it's called Guidewire. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is the, that is the uh, software suite that allows an insurance company to do all the things they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, they also decided it was time to uh, move their, uh, the portal page from an on-prem solution to a hosted solution mm -hmm. um, in the cloud uh, by EpiServer. Um, uh, as a, a third thing we, we decided was our authentication mechanism. We were doing it on-prem, but we moved that to Okta, which is a cloud-based mm -hmm. solution as well. Um, and we had, uh, Motorists had publicly communicated out to all of our agents that, hey, by this date, we're gonna have a new portal page. It's gonna work great. Uh, it's the, the, your experience is gonna be significantly improved and so the the whole company is it's the top it's the top uh, project mm -hmm. that we're, we're gonna have this big rollout it's gonna happen and maybe about four or five months before the the launch we realized there was not any out-of-the-box way to mm -hmm. connect our cloud authentication with our new cloud portal page mm -hmm. and go back into our data center for our new on-prem uh, backend apps. Um, so we, did, we didn't have a way to uh, get an agent to sign up, to do a single sign-on and to be able to, to have a seamless access. Mm -hmm. So we, we uh, you know, the network guys tried to figure out the, the answer mm -hmm. and the security guys took their shot at it, tried to figure out the answer. The app dev guys thought they knew what to do, but we were just spinning our tires. Mm -hmm. The problem was bigger than, than one IT group. So uh, we finally decided, okay, we're gonna get uh, something that we call a diverse integrated team mm -hmm. together. Uh, we're gonna get all the right people in a room. So we're gonna get the security guys, the architects, the network guys, um, the app dev people. Um, and we also realized that, hey, we don't have all of the knowledge and experience in-house. So we had to reach out um, both to F5, um, to one of our partners, Nexum, uh, to bring in some of that knowledge and experience. Mm -hmm. um, so we got in a room, got all the right people, 
And we whiteboarded and we talked through all of this for two days. Mm -hmm. But we committed, we said, we're gonna figure this out. Um, we, we had a bunch of different things we thought about. We um, got a little bit angry at each other. Um, we, there may have been some darts being <laughs> shot at each other. Um, but at the, when we were done, uh, we had our solution. And it, and it was, uh, F5 was right in the middle of it. Uh, well, you got through it. What, what was the solution? What did you come up with? Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, really we call it a, a hybrid cloud uh, environment that, that we have with, um, with the F5 um, at, at the edge of our data center, essentially acting as an application gateway. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what we did is the, the agent, when they sign on, um, they see a, an Okta screen, they type mm -hmm. in their username and password. Um, and that, uh, from Okta, there's a SAML assertion that connects to the F5. Uh, the F5, through uh, an iRule, takes that SAML token, looks at all the session attributes, pulls out the session attributes that it needs, and places them in a custom JSON token, and is able to send it <laughs> downstream to the backend apps, to the, uh, to the portal page, and that is what, that's what happens on the back end. On the front end, the agent just signed in, and now they have access to everything that they need. Mm -hmm. Wow, so the power of collaboration uh, across teams to uh, overcome that. Jason, perhaps one, one last question for you. Any advice you would have for uh, members of the audience who face a similar daunting uh, enormous project. Yeah, um, really it's a couple things that, mm -hmm. that we really learned. Um, we had to realize that, hey, maybe we can't solve this problem on our own. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times as technologists we want to, mm -hmm. and especially when, we're, when we have responsibility for the system, um, but sometimes you have to, you have to reach out to, mm -hmm. uh, to others uh, sometimes outside your own IT team, and sometimes outside the organization, mm -hmm. to bring the right people in um, to, to get the, the job done. The other thing I would say is uh, we really needed to keep the focus on what the business outcome needed to be, not as much on what should we do with the technology. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew that that portal page, it, it was very clear for us we knew that portal page had to work right. Mm -hmm. And so we had to align the technology to make that happen. Um, I, sometimes we'll, we'll uh, uh, fall victim to getting, getting uh, uh, so deep in the technology that sometimes maybe we don't see what the business outcome should be. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, we've certainly, uh, Motor has been guilty of that in the past. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, we kept that, what, what needed to happen uh, in, in front of everyone, and um, it, it had to happen by a certain rollout date. Mm -hmm. And by, by aligning the technology with F5 right in the middle of it, we were able to uh, deploy on time, mm -hmm. and we were able to give the, the agents the experience that we had committed that we were mm -hmm. gonna give to them. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a great success, and um, uh, greatly appreciate uh, F5. Well, thank you, Jason, and hopefully we're selling a ton of insurance through that uh, portal now that it's moving faster. Congratulations, and uh, thank you, Jason. Thanks thank for joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you. I, I now want to uh, bring on stage Amrish Rasinha from uh, Market Access. And um, for those of you who may not know Market Access, they are an investment trading platform uh, for institutional investors um, or broker-dealers. Uh, and they uh, have a daily volume of $7 billion per day. Uh, so you can only imagine the scrutiny uh, that their IT environment uh, is under. Uh, and Amrisha is going to come and talk to us about uh, how they're dealing with that and, and how they're organized. I met them in, in New York um, last year, and I was struck by uh, the way their team was organized and how they were going about dealing with cross-functional challenge. So please welcome to the stage Amrisha Sinha.
Amrisha, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, um, Amrisha, perhaps you can start. I was saying when I met you guys, I was struck by the way you were organized. Can you perhaps just start by describing your role in the organization? Yeah, my background is in networking and programming. Mm -hmm. So my role is to apply traditional DevOps practices to a very traditional network engineering platform. So mm -hmm. I get to call myself a network DevOps engineer. Hmm. But that, that can't be easy because traditionally, you know, net, network, networking functions, DevOps functions are not always seeing eye to eye in organizations. Is there tension in your organization? How do you deal with it? Not in our organization, but mm -hmm. that can be very true. The mm -hmm. common thread between both of those approaches is consistency, mm -hmm. and automation helps you provide more consistency and standardization in the platform. Mm -hmm. So I talked about automation a little earlier as a big area of investment for F5. I know you uh, are involved in uh, automating the network at Market Access. Can you take us through what you're doing and why that's important for you? Yeah, so my company is a fintech company and we're not allowed to work on production devices during the day within business hours. Mm -hmm. So if I can automate some of the processes so that they take place outside of business hours without requiring an engineer present, I'm freeing up some time. Mm -hmm. But I'm also able to ensure consistency in what actually happens. When that job runs, it runs the same way every time. Mm -hmm. Because no matter how hard you try, when many people work on the same thing, small changes creep in, it's only mm -hmm. natural. Mm -hmm. But with automation, if you can ensure consistency and peace of mind, mm -hmm. it not only makes the platform more stable, but it also frees up engineers to engineer more solutions rather than maintaining the old ones. Mm -hmm. So automation is very important, and network is the next frontier for getting automated. Mm. So a lot of folks I know here in the room are working on automation. You know, we know from the feedback we've received from our customers, this is an area where we have significant work to do to uh, reduce the operational overhead of implementing our solutions. And I think that's not just an F5 thing. I think it applies to other uh, platform vendors as well. Yeah, do you does. have any advice for folks in the, in the room for who would be working on automation? So I got started with automation three, automating the network about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And two years ago, we started migrating from our legacy load balancers onto the F5. Mm -hmm. With automation, I was able to move 50 VIPs a week consistently with confidence. And what that allowed us to do was move 4,000 VIPs, almost 4,000 VIPs in the space of two years only. If we didn't have automation in place, that process would have taken twice as long, twice as many resources, and we wouldn't have had the peace of mind with the migration if we didn't use that. We use Ansible for automation, and Ansible works directly with the native APIs on the F5 Big IP, which is great because I've been able to get access to developers at F5 who are working on the very modules that I use. Mm -hmm. And having that sort of feedback process to interact with them has mm -hmm. been great in making sure that the feature set that we use gets automated first, um, which, is, which is really helpful when you have to migrate 4,000 VIPs. Mm -hmm. um, my experience working with the developers has been, it's, it's been a very collaborative environment. They're very open to getting feedback. So if there's anything in particular that you guys would like to automate, um, I would just reach out and see if, if it can be put on the roadmap for the next thing that they do. Mm -hmm. And Ansible is also a great tool because what it's allowed us to do is develop a single platform. And not only does it work with our load balancers, but it also works with our routers, switches, firewalls. And that way we only really have one platform that we need to learn and work on rather than have to deploy something new every time. Um, mm -hmm. I'm here to learn from everyone else's experiences as well as share some of my own. So I'm happy to discuss some of this stuff further I'm here until the end of the conference. And I'm sure there'll be a number of folks who will want to talk to you about what you've done there on automation. And Marisha, thank you for sharing thank your you experience so and congratulations. Thank you. Well, so uh, Amrisha and Jason, they're both, you know, Motorist Insurance Group and Market Access. They're perfect examples to me of um, uh, the application capitalists that I described earlier in the sense that they are creating enormous value for their organizations uh, through applications. So I want to thank both of them for coming here and, and sharing their experience, sharing their story with us, as I want to thank you for being here and sharing your, um, your stories with us. Um, you know, a core tenant of the, the culture that we are nurturing at F5 is customer obsession. Um, I define it as, first and foremost, 
uh, never ever letting you down when you have a problem uh, in your environment, uh, whether it's to do with F5 or not, and, and having a world-class support team that truly, genuinely cares about you. And I take a lot of pride in the, the culture that we've built around servicing you. But the second aspect of customer obsession for us uh, in, in our culture is really obsessing over understanding your needs and acting on that knowledge with urgency. Now the urgency bit is the one that I spent a lot of time worrying about because as you scale, as you grow as a company, maintaining that urgency gets ever harder. And so I really genuinely want to thank you for being here because the fuel you give us, all the interactions we're gonna have with you uh, over the next two days are really a fuel on telling us what you need to, from us next and really keeping that flame up of urgency for the things we haven't done yet. And so I really encourage you as you uh, interact with us over the next couple of days to share your needs and keep reminding our teams of the urgency with which we need to act uh, in addressing your future needs. So with that, I wanna thank you for coming here again. Enjoy the conference and I'll see you over the next two days. Thank you.